So finally, in the series on Kabbalah and the women of the Bible, we move to Esther. Esther has her own book in the Hebrew Testament, in the book of Kings, the book of Esther, and she's placed here at Hesed, the place of honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Now, Esther is a fabulous story about coming into one's own perfect self, actually attaining the Christ within. And Esther is also told in another book, apart from the Bible, I strongly recommend this one if you like it. It's called Esther by Nora Lofts, who was a British author and Christian mystic who died in the 1980s. And Nora fills in spaces between the words in the Bible, and it's the most fabulous account of the whole of this story. I read it first when I was a teenager, and I'm still reading it now. However, Esther is the story of a young Jewish girl in the diaspora. This is after the Jewish nation has been conquered by the Babylonians, and then the Babylonians have been conquered by the Persians. And the Jewish people are living all over the Middle East. They've lost their temple and they've lost everything except their cultural identity. And I'm sure you know that the Jewish nation, the Orthodox Jewish nation, only supports marriage within its own nation. We looked at this in the story of Ruth earlier, and the idea of uh, a Moabite woman marrying into the Jewish race was most unusual. But we're talking about the soul tribe now, we're talking about stepping out of the tribe, we're talking about full human potential and not racial heritage. The story of Esther begins in Shushan, which is the capital of Persia. Ahasuerus is the warrior king of Persia, and he was a great warrior king, but he's pretty rubbish at being the ruling kind of king. He's married to a foreign princess. Uh, the mystical tradition says her name was Vashti, and she came from Persia, and she was very proud. Certainly in the Bible, the story begins with Ahasuerus divorcing Vashti. She's sent back home. The reason for that is because she humiliates him in front of a great big banquet of visiting dignitaries. Now Ahasuerus is so powerful, he doesn't need to marry another foreign princess. So the idea is put out that there should be a kind of beauty pageant across the whole of the Persian Empire. And the most beautiful women in Persia should be brought to the palace purified and beautified, and then each one of them gets one evening, well, one night really, with the king. And from this harem of women, he's going to choose the new queen of Persia. Esther is a Jewish girl living in Shushan with her uncle Mordecai. And Mordecai insists that Esther takes part in the pageant, which again is unusual. We, we see that Mordecai is a step above the common man because he's seeing beyond the tribe. And he's basically saying we could do with power in high places. Now, Esther joins the pageant and she wins her section and she is taken to the palace. And when she goes before the king, Nora Loth's book expands this beautifully and tells the story in such a magical way. But whatever happens, Esther charms the king and she is the one that he chooses for his bride. Now, in most stories, that's the happy ever after bit, isn't it? They got married and they lived happily ever after. But this is the soul we're talking about. And you know perfectly well from your own life, it doesn't necessarily work like that. Now, while Ahasuerus has been a single man, he has made a favourite at court, a chap called Haman, who's an Amalekite. Now, the Amalekites are age-old enemies of the Jews. They were displaced from the Promised Land when the Jews took over in the Promised Land after the exile from Egypt. And Haman hates all things Jewish. And it's quite clear from the story that Haman has very great power over the king. And Haman learns to hate Mordecai more than any other Jew, simply because Ahasuerus has made Haman very, very powerful in the kingdom, and everybody should bow to him. But Mordecai, now that Esther has become the queen of Persia, waits outside the gate of the great palace every day to hear news of the queen. It doesn't say he's her relative, because Mordecai has told Esther not to tell anyone she's Jewish. This is an important part of the story, because Esther has gone into her queenship actually denying her foundation. Ahasuerus doesn't know who she is. Now, this is a good thing from the point of view that he's loved her unreservedly for who she is. 
but she hasn't sort of owned up to her baggage, if you like, which is her tribal background. So Mordecai is waiting outside every day and saying, how is the queen, how is the queen, how is the queen? And Haman writes out every day, and Mordecai will not bow to Haman. Now, Judaic nation has often been called a stiff-necked people by the Judaic nation itself. And it's Mordecai's action which brings on the rest of the story, because he won't bow to Haman, and Haman is absolutely furious with him. And it would be very easy for Haman just to take out one little old Jewish guy, not a problem, except that while he's at the gates, Mordecai overhears a plot to kill the king. And he passes a message of that plot on to Esther in the palace. She tells the king, and the king is able to follow the plot. So the king says to Haman, well, make sure that the person that who told the queen is duly recorded in all the records and that he is rewarded. Well, Haman knows that it's the little old man who's really hacking him off every morning and does nothing to reward Mordecai. So Haman has put himself in the position of not being able to have Mordecai killed because the Jews always had quite fascinating funerals that the king was fascinated by. And they would have gone through the streets and cried out Mordecai's name. So the king would have heard that Mordecai the Jew died and would remember that this was the man who'd saved his life. So Haman was kind of hoist with his own petard. However, this is a story of good and evil. Haman is unquestionably evil because in order to destroy Mordecai, he decides to plan a massacre of the whole Jewish nation. And this is a pre-Holocaust to the Holocaust, if you like. And he takes his time to persuade the king that this is appropriate, that the Jewish nation should be destroyed. And he succeeds. So the king sends out an edict that the Jewish nation should be destroyed. That's because they won't uh, assimilate. That's because they won't worship the Persian gods. Mordecai hears about this because there are notices put up all over the land and he writes to Esther saying to her, this is your time, this is why you're queen. Now we haven't heard anything else about Esther apart from the fact that the king marries her. But then she sends a message back to Mordecai saying, there's nothing I can do, the king has not sent me for me for 30 days. Now in those days the king of Persia only got people visiting him when he said so. He didn't just turn up and say hello, and even his wife would be sent for. So this is a young marriage, and there's no children yet, and Esther has not been sent for for 30 days. So something has gone horribly wrong. Something is not working in this marriage that was supposed to be the happily ever after. So Esther's in a quandary. She can't go before the king because the laws of the Medes and the Persians was very firm in this resolve. And if you did go before the king and you did not get him to hold out his scepter to grant you mercy, you were killed and that was it. And this is a king who's already got rid of one unpopular wife. So Esther sends a message back to Mordecai saying, no, I can't do anything, I'm sorry, my hands are tied. And Mordecai sends a really important message back to her. He says, if you won't do this, then another saviour will arise for Israel. But maybe you have come into the kingdom for such a time as this. And when he says come into the kingdom, he says come into Malkut, come into existence for this. And quite often it's talked about that maybe you become royal because of this, but actually Malkut means kingdom. And in the Kabbalistic tree of life in Jacob's ladder, the Malkut of heaven kingdom of heaven is the place that Esther has to come into. She has to come into her true self and she is Queen of Persia. And I suspect that the whole problem between her and the king is she hadn't been able to step up into being Queen of Persia. So Esther sends a message back and this is where the principle of the Sabbath comes in because she doesn't just go, okay I'll do it. She says, yes I understand. Pray and fast for me for three days. And then I will go to the king, and if I die, I die. So she's given herself these three days, and this is the Sabbath principle, of stepping back and waiting for the help and the inspiration. And then on the third day, in the Bible it says she puts on her royal apparel, but actually she puts on her malkut, she puts on her kingdom, she comes into herself, 
her true self, and she goes before the king. And he immediately extends the golden scepter to her in mercy. And he says to her, Queen Esther, what is it that you would have me do?